Hello, I'm Peter Luckman. I'm the National Lead for Safe Situation Awareness for Everyone, which is a Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health initiative funded by the Health Foundation. And today I'm going to talk to about uh, patient safety and how we apply the principles to this program so that you can put patient safety at the forefront of everything you do in real time. Now the quality system that we have in healthcare is based on the Institute of Medicine six domain, domains of quality and safety. And these domains are shown over here. You have effective care, that's the care that we are doing at all times. You have transparency, which is not in the original cause, you are open about what you do, so that you can really look at it. You have equitable care, everyone gets the same quality of care at all time. Efficient care means that there's no waste, that you're doing things at the right time, providing reliable care at all times. Timely care, patients get the care they need, when they need it, and the most important one, I think, is that the care is safe at all times. Now, we're going to be talking about patient safety, but in essence, we're talking about all of these domains at all at one time, because I think that you have to put the person into it all. And as you can see, person-centered care is all around these ones. So let's go about the center, the idea of respect, holistic care, partnership, and compassion. This is essential for the SAFE program, and this is what you're going to build into the huddles as you go forward. Now recently, the international community has taken patient safety to a higher level. In Tokyo, in April of this year, in 2018, governments came together to affirm their belief that patient safety is a national and international priority for all governments. The WHO is leading on this, and our SAFE program here is just one small part of the overall aim to improve safety for people around the world. And it's very important that you read the last sentence, a culture of safety and transparency. And that is what SAFE is all about, building the culture of safety. Because the reality is that we harm 10 to 15 percent of patients. So if you have a ward of 30 patients, that's between three and five are being harmed at any one time. And harm is viewed from the eyes of the patient, the child, and their family, not only from our view of adverse events. The good news is that we don't harm 85 to 90 percent. So we have to understand how we manage to keep most patients safe and how we manage to harm some patients. And that is really what this is all about, proactively trying to understand how we can keep the children who we care for safe. And that is the crux of the huddle. Now, patient safety and quality is up to chance. If you're a gambler and you go to a casino, what happens is you have to put your money on one of the numbers and hope your number comes up. So what often happens in healthcare, the patients come to the hospital and what happens there, they have a bit of a lottery. Sometimes they get effective care, sometimes they get efficient care, and sometimes they don't. Now, safety in 2009 was defined in this very good review by the then National Patient Safety Agency, which was no longer, no longer exists. And they detected a number of uh, different points that are important. Delayed recognition of disease, or in their case, delayed recognition of deterioration. Medication harm, underreporting of conditions, the lack of integration, poor communication, and mental health. These are issues that still exist in 2018. And we are really concentrating on the top two, delayed recognition as well as under-reporting. For historical reasons, it's a good, it's a good uh, exercise to reread this document because a lot of the things from 2009 exist in 2018. In 2018, there was recently a review in the Journal of, Amer of the American Medical Association, JAMA, from Braithwaite and Company in Australia, which looked at the quality of health care in, in the children in Australia in the period, they say, 2012 to 2013, well, for the few years after that, they started studying this in 2015-16, they, 
They reviewed case notes of children retrospectively to see if they were following good quality principles. And lo and behold, they found in almost 60% of the time, children were not getting the care they were supposed to get. This mirrored an earlier study for adults, which showed 50%. What does this mean for us? Here in the UK, the principles will be exactly the same as the study. We most probably don't provide standardised care to children as we should, as reliably as we should. So if Braithwaite found that 60% of the time children in Australia are not receiving the care they should, what is the real rate here? In patient safety, the early studies said between 10 and 15% of the time we harm children. What is the real rate? Here are a number of studies that are put up here which help us determine the real rate. If you look in Canada, the adverse event rate studies. If you look over here, the trigger tool, the one we did in the UK, an electronic trigger tool that came from the United States, and a systematic review uh, by Hibbert and, and other colleagues, all show that by using the trigger tool methodology, the similar kind of methodology that Braithwaite used, i.e. case note review, you'd find that the rates were between 10 and 15%. But the rate has not really improved over the last years. That was the original one. What's wrong? Because safety is a moving target. A moving target. And what does that mean? Things that we thought were not harm in the past, for example, line infections, we now know are harm because we can prevent them. Like falls, pressure ulcers. There are many forms of harms that we thought were consequences of conditions we now know are not consequences because they're totally preventable and avoidable. So harm is a moving target as is patient safety, which makes it difficult. A lot of the things we accepted in the past, we now are saying we can prevent if we anticipate rather than react. And that's what the huddle's all about. How can we move to decreasing this number? Now, one of the problems we have in healthcare is that we deliver it in silos. A child who comes to a hospital has to see different silos if they have chronic conditions, different caregivers, and often they don't communicate. The huddle is aimed at bringing all that information together so that it can integrate and we can keep the child safe. It's to try to break down the walls of the silos of care that we have designed. And the silos can be between the community, primary care and secondary care, between secondary and tertiary care, and when you're in tertiary care, between all the different departments of the tertiary care. So we really want to use the huddle to break down these silos of care, to improve communication, and to keep our patients safer. The next challenge we have now, to, and one of the reasons why patient safety is now a big issue, is because of the complexity. Not only the complexity of the patients, and the fact that they have more than one condition affecting more than one organ, that they're living longer, often the children who would have died are now alive because we are intervening, so that's one complexity. But the complexity of our interventions, the more technology, the more difficult the interventions, the more we are doing, the more we have to integrate the complexities of our, of our interventions, the more difficult it is to be safe. So complexity adds another layer. And another good paper from Braithwaite in Australia talks about complexity science, how we have to apply complexity to all that we do. And one of the things that comes out of this paper is the understanding that unless we work at our microsystems to deal with this complexity, to constantly study and see how we can make it safer, we will not be safe. The huddle is aimed at doing just that to help you deal with the complexity and the silos to make it safer for the children. So the key thing is something quite simple. We cannot carry on as we are. We have to change in order to improve. We have to change in order to make things much safer. Let's start on the first item of safety, the idea of the culture of safety. Now, the culture defines what we do, how we do it, 
because it's based on our beliefs, our attitudes, our values. If safety is not our business, then we will not be safe. And that is quite clear. And I'm talking about other industries, the airline industry, for example. The only reason it became safe is because the public demanded it. In the early 1980s, there were a number of serious accidents that caused the public to say, if you want us to fly, you have to be safe. And the culture of safety came in. Nuclear power, the same story. In the 1980s, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl changed people's attitudes to nuclear power. And the message came out from governments and from the public who told governments that they wanted this. If you want nuclear power, make it safe. And that's what had to happen. And nuclear power became safe. These kind of issues apply to healthcare. We just haven't studied it very well. Culture is the foundation of safety. Here are a number of papers that are coming up which talk about the importance of safety in different pediatric situations and the importance of culture as the foundation of safety. And the key thing is that cultures differ from different areas, and that's about the context. We have to understand culture. I quite like to think about what are the barriers to quality and safety. And the barriers come with facilitators because each barrier could be a facilitator. Tradition. This is the way we do things here. That's a big barrier. It could also be a facilitator if the way you do things is a good way. So you don't throw out the way you do things because there's a reason. Study it. You want to make it safer. So tradition is not bad. It only becomes a problem if it becomes a barrier. This is the way we do things we cannot try. And you're going to hear about the huddle being a barrier to the way, uh, the way people do things because people will say, we can't do the huddle here because it's not the way we do things. So tradition can be good because you can find within that tradition a way to change. Power. We have built health care where doctors have most of the power and within the doctors' groups, Different doctors have different power. Power is not bad. It's how you use your power, how you integrate it and how you understand it. So studying power, which can be a barrier or a facilitator, because if you get the right person who's got the power to influence change on board right from the start, then you're going to have a very easy ride in introducing huddles. So understand who has the power to object and who has the power to facilitate and know how to utilize this power. Professionalism is often a problem. Doctors and nurses working in their own systems and not interacting and thinking that professionalism, as a doctor, I do things for my patients the way I want to do it rather than working in a team, that can be a barrier. But it can also be a positive thing because we can appeal to the higher professional attributes of doctors and nurses to keep the patient safe. The arrogance of excellence is something that often happens we are doing things very well here, why do we need to change? I've heard that so many times. What do you have to say? Can we do it better? Because we can always improve. And anyway, how do you know you are excellent? Are you measuring and are you studying your data continually? So the arrogance of excellence is appealing to people's higher desire to excel because most people want to be the best. I've mentioned the silos already and that's what the huddle's about, breaking silos. Silos are not only between different departments, they are between different parts of the team. I'll give you an example. In most hospitals, the nurses do their own handover and the doctors do their hand over. Two different silos with the same information interpreted differently, and yet they don't meet together. That's a silo that the huddle aims to break about sharing information. So silos are, could be not only primary or secondary care, but can also apply within our microsystem. You have to understand the silos. The next one is the failure to learn. We're not very good at learning in the healthcare. What happens in one hospital, we don't learn in another hospital. And I mentioned earlier that we, the importance of sharing our learning is so, so important for all of us that we have to really constantly think, how do we learn? And that is something microsystems need to analyze all the time, not only some of the time. When I talked about quality improvement, I really spoke about the importance of studying variation. Why does it work on one day and not on another? 
Why does it work with one part of our microsystems on and not with another? Why does one doctor prescribe this type of antibiotic and another one doesn't? Studying variation is essential, and that's what we're going to do in the huddles, constantly study our variation in order to minimize it. We should only vary when necessary. And of course, underline it is the culture, because the culture defines what we do, and that includes the traditions, the professionalisms, the way we learn, the way we study variation, and how we deal with power and arrogance. Now, the Heinrich accident principle is pretty old. It comes from the 1930s, it comes from industry. And it really is quite simple. It's about the tip of the iceberg issue. For every one catastrophe, a child that dies due to medical error, there are 30 serious incidents. For every 30 serious incidents, which could be a line infection, a medication harm, there are 30, 300 intermediate incidents. You know, an, or, uh, an incident that was reversible and didn't cause harm. For that, there are 3,000 near misses. They really should be called near hits. That something nearly happened, but someone intervened and saved the day. But there are 30,000 at-risk behaviors. So for example, for every child that dies from an infection, there are many at-risk behaviors of not hand washing or hand hygiene that caused that infection that went undetected. Now, quality improvement and patient safety principles really aim usually at this area. We do risk cause analyses for these. We don't study the near misses. And the culture defines our at-risk behaviors. You'll see later on how this applies in the theories of patient safety. And if you look at the uh, N NPSA again, the Manchester Patient Safety Scale, which is based on work from Shell, and uh, you can read it in articles by Hudson, there are different levels of culture in an organization, from pathological, which is defined as as long as nothing happens, all things are fine, to reactive, which is uh, when things go wrong, we do lots of stuff. That's where most of us are. To calculative, where often we count a lot, we report a lot, we have systems to report and we manage most hazards. And to proactive, we work on problems we still find. To generative, safety is our business. It's our number one thing. We also treat children. Now, this kind of idea, which has increased mindfulness and increased information as we go ahead, more transparency, more discussion, that's where we want to go. You could use the MAPSAF, the Manchester Patient Safety Scale, to assess your clinical team. That's something you could do. And you could see where we are on it. You'll also be quite interested to note that parts of our hospitals are way up here. Blood transfusion, anesthetics, they are looking for problems the whole time. Blood transfusion is often ingenerative. This is the way we do things. You do it exactly the same way every time. You don't take risks. Other parts are down here. So we really need to look at the complexity of our patient safety and understand the culture of our clinical team. Where is your microsystem? Are you generative? Can you say safety and quality is how we do business? Because if you're not talking about it all the time, it definitely isn't. The huddle gives you a chance to go to generative and proactive because you're talking about quality, you're talking about safety in real time, all the time. Currently, most people don't do that. So let's look at the theories of patient safety. When I trained originally, it was really this idea of individual responsibility. As a professional, as a doctor, I'd be safe. We then introduced risk management. That really came at the turn of the century, uh, around about 18, uh, in the 1990s, when we had really serious incidents. And risk management and clinical responsibility became very important. We called it clinical governance, root cause analysis, and so on, all came in then. We then, over the next 10 or 15 years, introduced things that came from other industries, such as human factors and ergonomics, and SEEP's socio-technical approach, which I'm going to introduce later. 
If we introduce that understanding, if you understand these human factors and the way we design for safety, maybe we get safety. Currently, system theory is the big thing. I study how the system works, and you might recall I spoke about Deming, who said you have to understand your system and study your system. This is one of the things that come in. You have to have individual responsibility, yet you have to understand the way the system works. Then came the ideas that we should introduce reliability theory, high reliability theory, which is how can we do the right thing all the time. And finally, the last one has just come out now and still been tested, this idea of safety too, which is how can we be resilient and study what we know works in order to be safer. So I'm going to take you through a journey of all these theories and tell you or to ask you to try and incorporate this in your day-to-day -day work within the method of the huddle. It's how do you can make complex patient safety theories easy for frontline staff to do because it's the way they do things, so that you become generative and proactive in your patient safety. The first one is individual responsibility, and of course this is very important. The Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, which was uh, something that most of us really thought was the way forward, is the underlying pin, uh, pin of all medication uh, uh, safety or all healthcare safety is that we must not harm patients. However, the problem is it's not as easy as first do no harm because healthcare is so complex now, it's very easy to harm patients. So this is not sufficient. You really have to think about key actions to move to ultra safe care. This paper by Amal Bertier and his colleagues came out and spoke about a number of things that you have to do. Consider about maximum performance. It's no use trying to work harder to be safe. You have to work smarter to be safe. The abandonment of professional autonomy. It's not the responsibility of doctors now. It's the responsibility of the team as a whole. And your teamwork, your clinical microsystem is essential that it's working well. You have to move from this idea of a craftsman, which is as we were trained, to an equivalent actor, everyone in the team is important. Not only the leading consultant or doctor in the team, but every team member. And that's what the huddle does. It tries to flatten the hierarchy. It's not that hierarchy is bad. It's that hierarchy can impede hearing other people's concerns. And that's what the huddle is about, trying to bring the concerns under play. If that doesn't work, you need a system-led arbitration rules that people apply. And that's where you need support of the whole system. And finally, you need to make sure it's easy to do the right thing. And the right thing is easy to do. We make it too difficult to do the huddle, it just won't work. So make it easy and make it something that people can see as relevant and making their job easier to be safe. Risk management, which is basically the foundation of most safety initiatives in most hospitals, and that falls under reactive and calculative, counting a lot, investing a lot, is something that is very important. We have to understand how to manage risk. And incident reporting and patient safety is an essential part. Unfortunately, doctors don't report as much as they should, and they leave it to nurses. Part of the huddle is to try to get the incidents reported in real time to make it relevant so it doesn't go out to a clinical risk investigation team, that we are constantly studying our risk and trying to make it safer. So risk management doesn't become something that someone else does, it becomes part of what we do. And then it's a very positive thing. We have to move from risk management to safer care. And this is really moving from uh, defense and acting against harm and just reporting to national systems because we have to, to tack in improvement and setting goals. And this is really what the huddle's about. It's moving from manage, risk management to preventing harm. And that is where we really want to go. So I think that it's very important to have risk management. We have to bring it closer to the clinical teams. The microsystems need to take responsibility for it with the help of the risk management department. Nowadays, usually it's a risk management department that does all the root cause analyses. We need to start working on that and seeing how we can be safer. But in the safe system, situation awareness for everyone, what we are trying to do is bring this into the clinical system, in the microsystem, on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Now, if you consider this book by Alma Berti, Safer Healthcare, free on the website, you can download it. They talk about the different areas where we work, from optimal care and adherence to systems, all the way down to harm exceeds benefits. Poor care, unreliable care. Most of us work in this area, unreliable care. That means the patient may get the care they need safely or may not. Depends which clinical team is on, which depends which time of day they get in. Most of us do that because we don't have standardized ways of working. We often say it's the complexity of the patients, we can't do that. But it's really true that if you standardize most of what you do, then you're trying to find out the patients who don't fit standardized care in order to deliver reliability. Really, personal safety is to move this unreliable care, where there's no harm, we're just lucky that we don't have harm, to where we comply with standards, the way we've decided we're going to treat, all the way to optimal care, which means we provide what we're supposed to do all the time, and we don't only when the patient's condition demands that we do something different rather than we do something different. That's what safety and reliability is about. Let's look at human factors and ergonomics and the socio-technical way of looking at it. And here we go. This is a prospective look at the harm. I've taken something from Charles Vincent, which is a, the London Protocol, which is a way at looking at serious events and saying, well, why can't we use it prospectively? Why can't this happen every day in every clinical unit, in every clinical microsystem, asking these questions every day? The latent failures here. These are our culture. What's our culture? Are we looking at our culture? Do we have a culture of safety? Or do we not have a culture of safety? How do our decisions affect our safety? Those are called the latent failures. This leads to the SEEPS model or the the model of socio-technical looking or the ergonomics or patient safety human factors, which is looking at the different things that you have to talk, look, uh, look about. And we want you to do this every day in the huddle. What are the environmental factors that may cause harm? Are there any factors about the team that you have to consider? What's our team like today? Are there any staff factors? So for example, someone who has a new baby, hasn't slept the whole night, comes to work, very tired, what do we have to do? When you get new staff, do they know what they have to do? Do, they, do you know all about them? How about the task factors? Do we have the right tasks? Do we have patients on whom the tasks may be different? And the patient factors, are patients different? Do we have the right patients in our area? All of these things make the human factors and they all interplay into quality and safety. So we have to study this in real time, not in past time. The next areas, are really the acts of failures. These are the unsafe acts, not, not following good hand hygiene, not following the procedures for prescriptions, and using abbreviations when one shouldn't, not signing your name, not printing your name as well as signing it so we know who's ordered, not double checking whether you're given the right dose. These are unsafe acts which can lead to the errors, and these errors can lead to harm. And of course, the blatant violations of what policy is. Now, we build the Swiss cheese model, that's from reason. All these defenses, double checking, the pharmacy checks, someone else checks. But if these barriers are all lined up in the wrong way, you can get harm. Now, this, this model that comes from Charles Vincent can be used prospectively rather than retrospectively. That means the clinical teams every day can ask, what's our culture like today? Who's in our team? Who are our staff members? Do we have different patients? Are there any factors that we have to worry about? Are there any tasks that we have to do? Do we have the right equipment? These are things you should be asking in real time. Did we follow the procedures? Were there any violations in the last 24 hours that we have to address? And why were they? And why did we follow? And were there any harms that we need to look at? All of this can be done every day in real time rather than in past time, which is the way we normally do it under risk management. Reliability theory, 
has been introduced to understand whether we can get the right treatment to the patient the right time, every time. And this is really what it means, that the person, in our case a patient, a child, gets the right treatment the first time, every time, not dependent on whom they've seen, when they come in, which hospital they go to, but the right treatment. Often this is a problem because we don't know what the right treatment is and we have different views. But your clinical microsystem should decide this is the way we treat community-acquired asthma, uh, pneumonia, asthma, urinary tract infections. This is the way we do things, whatever your business might be. You say, this is the way we do it. But when the patient doesn't fit the criteria, we allow to vary. That's why you study variation. So right place, right nurse, right treatment, no delays, coordinated and safe, and the patient being in the right bed. All of these are about reliability. The problem is, healthcare is terribly unreliable. If you remember earlier, Braithwaite and his colleagues said 60% of the time do we deliver right care. So what is it here? You have to study your own system to see how reliable you are. And you'll be surprised to find how unreliable generally most systems are for many different reasons, either because of beliefs, culture, processes, lack of agreement. We need to really fix this. And the huddle is something about building reliability. The concept of high reliability comes from a number of authors, Week and Sutcliffe, who wrote a book about managing the unexpected. What they did is they studied high reliability organizations, what they called organizations that get it right more than, more than you can imagine. They only get errors one in a million times. What are those organizations? Nuclear power, the airline industry, the military. Those are organizations that really aim for high reliability. Healthcare, unfortunately, is way across the line and being totally unreliable. We're happy when we get it right eight, eight times out of 10. That's our best we can get. Part of it is very reliable, such as blood transfusion. However, reliability is not what we need. So let's see what reliability is and how it applies to the huddle. The first thing is this idea of preoccupation with failure, in our case, preoccupation with harm. We need to study it in real time. The smallest errors we need to study. So if you want to decrease medication harm, you have to understand, uh, study the reliability of your prescribing. It's got to be 100% reliable. However, if you look at the scripts that go to pharmacy, most studies show that anything between 20 and 40% of the time have errors. That's unreliable, yet we tolerate it. So you have to understand that the smallest error, the smallest error can lead to a problem. And if you remember about the at-risk behaviours, you know, the ones in the Heinrich Pyramid, those were the ones right at the bottom of the pyramid, those smallest things, those are the ones that lead to the catastrophe. So a high reliability organisation is constantly studying its errors, its harms, the smallest things, the smallest detail. An example about that is Apollo 10. The tiles were falling off. It was not considered a big thing. It was a small little thing, and yet the, 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 when it took off, it blew up. And when they studied it, they noticed that it had been reported, but it wasn't considered to be of importance. So smallest things are very important. The next one is this idea of sensitive to operations. This is where the huddle comes in, paying attention to what's happening on the front line. The huddle allows you to pay attention what's happening in real time because it's happening in the front line and you can study that. And that's where you also study the small errors because you study in real time. The third thing is the reluctance to simplify. We often try to simplify and blame uh, people quite easily for when things go wrong, but understand the complexity of our work and the way it works. We have to really look at how this complexity can be made understandable by breaking it down to small parts. And that's what the huddle will do, allow you to understand the complexity. And what the real huddle is about is this next point. 
It's resilience, constantly learning, learning from the good things as well as things that went wrong. And this really allows you to detect what's going on and allows you to honor the front line and the report back from events so that when things do go wrong, you can fix it and move on. And the final thing is the deference to expertise. The huddle is about breaking down the silos of hierarchy so everyone's viewpoint is important. And in some huddles, they have had the dinner lady speaking. Now, the dinner lady does not exist in the medical hierarchy, but she goes to the, to the huddle to give her point of view. Some have had school teachers, some have had play leaders, not only the doctors and nurses. So it's everyone's view. So at that point of the huddle, there is no hierarchy, even though the one exists. There's no hierarchy because everyone's view is important. Now, these are the characteristics of a high reliability organization. What we want are highly reliable microsystems. Because if every microsystem aimed at being highly reliable, then that's what will happen to the organization and patients will be safer. So we're going to apply this high reliability theory within the huddle. And reliability as the aim is really moving on to a reliable system that goes up this arrow so that the patients feel safe at all time. Because after all, this is what it's all about. As a patient, a child, a parent, they want to make sure they get the right treatment at the right time safely, the stuff they're supposed to have. That's reliable care. So keep that in mind for the huddle. Now, we really looked at high reliability at interventions that should happen. There was a paper about adult medicine in adults uh, by Shakeli on the top things you have to do, the evidence base. So John Fitzsimons and David Vaughan wrote this paper on the 10 top interventions. We ran a survey through Pipsqui to see what are the things that we have to do. And here are 10 things that you should look at, 10 different areas we're looking at high reliability. And these are very important, no pain or distress. That's pretty simple, not often done. Are we doing it reliably? No tissue injury, pressure ulcers, extravasation of fluids. It says no. That means 100% of the time. To do that, you have to really look ahead. Early recognition of complications, deteriorations. This is where the huddle is really about, all these early recognitions. And no psychological harm. These are things that we really should be aiming for. And here's a survey result from Pipsqui that we looked at and seen all the different things that we should do in order to achieve the high reliability and the outcomes that were in the previous slide. So it's very important to understand the complexity of it all. And the huddle is a way to start to unravel that complexity to make it safer. Now let's look at the systems. In the talk on uh, improvement methodology, I spoke a lot about microsystems. And the huddle is all about improving your microsystem working. How do we do it? And this is not new stuff, new theories. Acuff spoke about the importance of focusing on the interactions of the different parts of the system. So he's looking at a major system, let's say a hospital. And if a hospital wants to be safe, it has to have the microsystems working together to be safer together. And the huddle aims at helping you improve the microsystem safety. Now, systems theory is not new also in healthcare now. This is a paper from the Institute of Medicine that came out in 2007. And it said, really, systems theory is about applying scientific knowledge in a reliable way, understanding the interactions between all the systems and maximizing the outcomes. But that's not easy because of the complexity. He has a paper from Ross Baker which gives a number of ways you can do this. Focusing on quality improvement, uh, having leadership, competency, strengthening primary care so that you interact well. They were talking more about engaging patients and caregivers in it. We don't normally do that that well. Uh, we think we do, but really how can we make them equal partners attending to accuracy, access and equity issues? And that's access and equity not only to the hospital, but to good care, to standardized reliable care. So these are the attributes of highly performing health systems. Again, you can download this from the internet. So we need system redesign. 
And the huddle is about that. It's redesigning your system. Redesign your system so it's about safety, that quality and safety become your business, and you happen to look after children. And for systems theories, I just want to remind you what you have to do, and this comes from Deming. You have to understand your system by looking at its processes. You have to study the variation in the system. You have to study the people who cause the variation, their beliefs, their attitudes, why they do things. And then you have to have your theory of change, which will come out in your driver diagrams and aim statements and the theory of what should happen. And your application of change, we use in the model for improvements, you could use other ones too. And the framework of a safety really comes from uh, work by Vincent, who studied uh, a number of hospitals and organizations to see what are the key things we have to do. I've added this one. We're going to ask in the huddle, what do we do well? Why? Because we want to replicate. We're then going to look at the past harm and the harm that happened in the last six hours, the last eight hours, the last 12 hours. What had happened? How we're going to do that there is we have to know what kind of harm happens on our ward. In the neonatal intensive care, it will be extravasation of fluids, unplanned extubation, and maybe uh, an, a necrotizing enterocolitis, et cetera, et cetera, which are very different from the harms on a general pediatric ward, which may be falls, which may be medication harm, maybe pressure ulcers. So you have to know what your harms are, and you only do it by studying them, but we want you to talk about it in real time. You're going to ask about reliability. Are we doing what we're supposed to do? Are we giving the care we're supposed to give? And that's studying variation. You're then going to be sensitive to operation, and that's where the SEEPS model comes in, the human factors. Do we have the right team? What are the staff issues we have to consider? What are the patient issues? What are the environmental issues? Do we have the right tools for our job? This is where you put the human factors bit. The crux of the, hustle, of the huddle is can we anticipate what's going to happen? Can we anticipate are we going to be safe? And the last one's very important. Are we learning? Can we learn from what we've done and we go around the cycle again? Now, Charles Vincent had designed this mainly at a higher level. So this should be happening throughout the hospital, from the clinical system, microsystem, right at the ground where the teams are doing it every six to eight hours, to the division area where the division's considering how our division is safe, right up to the suite of the, of the CEO and the chief medical officers who are asking, are we safe today by getting the information from the microsystems? They should be doing this throughout the hospital. Now, the problem is complexity. Here again, Alma Berti gives us complexity. This is really saying the difference between our different parts of our work. Some of our hospitals are ultra safe. Some parts of our hospitals. Radiotherapy is ultra safe. There are strict procedures. They have strict guidelines. They are regulated. Blood bank, ultra safe regulated. If you have an unsafe blood bank, it will be closed. You have to stick to the guidelines because we know the way to do things. So that's part of our business. And as you can see, that relates to commercial airlines, railways, and nuclear power. You then have the reliability part. That relates to firefighting, charter airlines, other industries. In reliability, we want to get it as reliable as we can. And that means we're going to use certain interventions like care bundles where, for example, we know that to, to, if you want to get rid of surgical site infections, you have to do four things. You don't shave the patient, you avoid hypothermia, you avoid hypoglycemia, and you give the antibiotic within 30 minutes of knife to skin. If you do all four of those, you're going to, risk, you're going to decrease surgical site infections to almost 95%, by 95% of not having them. But you have to do all four. It's no use doing three out of four. And that's what we, we're talking about. That's high reliability. And that's most of what we want to do. But you have to standardize as much as possible, all based on evidence. And the last one is this one called ultra-adaptive. Now, we all think we're ultra-adaptive, but it's really only in certain areas of where we work. That is where we need to be adaptive. In sometimes, say, cardiothoracic surgery, where they discover something and the surgeon has to adapt immediately to some new position. In ED, when you have trauma and you have to adapt to the new situation. You're trying to be reliable, but you have to allow adaptability. 
Now we have to understand that healthcare is a combination of this. This is the complexity of healthcare. And our health system is to try to make it, as far as we can, safe, ultra safe, but you have to become reliable first. The huddle aims at trying to do that. Because the strategies are quite clear. You can talk about risk control, you can talk about safety as best practice, that's what the huddle is trying to do. You can look at improving, well we're starting, that's where we're going to be starting to try and improve processes. But the main thing is constantly mitigating against harm in real time not in past time, after the event. Why do we need to do this? Well, we need to do this for many different reasons. The first is it's good for patients. It's what they're demanding. The second is good for staff. And the third is good for the budget because it is cheaper to be safe than to be unsafe. This study by Klazinka et al. showed that the costs of lapses in safety were more expensive than interventions. I really believe if you do the huddle and you decrease safety events, the time that you spend on the huddle will be less than the time you spend on the safety and harm events that have occurred, the adverse events. It takes far more time to do the pressure ulcer bundle and prevent pressure ulcers than it takes, far less time than it takes to treat a pressure ulcer. And I can apply that to most of the things. Less time to get your scripts right than to deal with a medication harm incident. And cost less. And the highest costs are these, all preventable. Venous vein thrombosis, pressure ulcers, medication errors, wrong and delayed diagnosis. What we are trying to do in the huddle is decrease this. And it will show well on your budget, as well as improving quality and safety for your patients and well-being for your staff. Overall, most of our expenditure on patient safety is less than we waste on harm events, and we really need to move forward. Safety two, or resilience theory, is the last bit of the puzzle. And it's just come in, uh, Hornarel, Braithwaite, uh, and their colleagues have brought us forward. It's not new. It's been around for a long time in industry called the ETO principle about how can we learn from a good experience. And Hornagel says that safety is the ability of the system to be safe under expected and unexpected conditions. What does that mean? If you fly an, air, uh, fly an a scheduled aircraft, what you want is air traffic control to be safe whether it is raining and snowing or whether it's a clear day. You want it to be safe day and night on weekends as well, whether it's expected or unexpected. You want them to know what they're going to do if someone's ill, that they're always safe. Healthcare is not that. We're not able to respond as well. So we really need to look at that. And what we must do is not something that you just count, that's a calculative, it's the way you do things. So we really need to build it in. And resilience is about learning and learning and adapting. And the safety is ready to do it. You must do what you do every day, absolutely every day. So to do this, you can study this paper. Here it is that you can download for free from the internet. And it's really looking at this kind of concept. Risk management looks at when things go wrong. What we really want to do is look when things go right. So you'll see in the huddle what we ask, what did we do well? That's studying how we got it right most of the time. You can then look at how it didn't go right some of the time. So the difference between uh, safety one and safety two is shown on this table. Basically, in safety one, which is all the others, that is risk management, systems theory, reliability, the idea is that few things go wrong as possible. Whereas in safety two, what they're saying, uh, as many things go right as possible. A slight difference. And really the access investigation in safety two is looking at cause and effect where people went wrong. And here in safety two, they want to study when things go right. What we really want to do in the huddle is bring these two theories together in real time. 
So we are doing studying what things go right so we can learn from it, as well as studying when things go wrong, but both in real time rather than in past time. And to achieve this, we really need to look at how we care for our staff. And this is about uh, what happens when things go wrong. How do we support them? Uh, it's only now that we're talking about the concept of the second victim. The first victim being the child or the patient who's been harmed. And the second victim is the person who actually caused that harm. How do we do that? How do we look compassionately at that? And I mentioned earlier the importance about looking after our staff. It's very important that we do that in real time as well as in past time, or not at all, as is often the case. So where does all this theory come? We're going to apply this theory in the SAFE model. It's going to look at personal responsibility, building in risk management in real time. We're going to look at the socio-technical and human factors in real time. We're going to ask you to use reliability theory and systems theory as part of the huddle. And we're also going to build in resilience. The method to do this will be the huddle in order to achieve it, so that frontline staff can take the complexity of patient safety and apply it to their day-to-day -day work. And when they do that, they are becoming proactive and generative rather than reactive. So the key thing is that we have to lead for safety. We have to have leadership to ensure we get reliable care, that we have to educate our staff for quality and safety. We have to make safety our business case. We have to be able to say, that safety and quality is what we do. We also promote health, diagnose, manage and treat patients.